distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Professor M.K. Othman, uh, the, the Executive Director of National Agricultural Extension and Satellite Services. The title of the paper, uh, A Roadmap to Sustainable Agriculture in Nigeria. Uh, so a way of... Uh, Uh -huh. This is the outline of the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, now, as a way of introduction, Nigeria is one of the countries in the West Africa, and it's one of the 54 countries in Africa. Uh, it's the largest country in Africa. Uh, it was colonized by the British, and the Almation was done in, in 1914, and. Uh, in 1960, the country gained independence. At the time of the independence, the country was just 43 million people. And presently, the country has over 200 million people. What it means is that there has been a change of over 400% from the time the country got independent to today. And uh, the rate of increase in population, uh, in Nigeria, hourly we have an estimate of about 850 babies being born, and we have about 280 people dying, giving us, uh, you know, a population increase of 570 per hour. Uh, the country, the way it's moving, uh, in the next uh, you know, 20, 10 years, Nigeria will be over 260 million, and by the year 2040, Nigeria will be 400, over 400 million people and it will be the third most populous country in the world after India and China. Uh, this really gives us the challenge of, that is accompanied with demography because there's issue of food security. And the country as of today has about 91 million hectares of land. And out of this 91 million hectares of land, only about 50 has been cultivated. Uh, unfortunately, the life expectancy of the country, uh, because of the large population, because of several other challenges that perhaps we will see later, the life expectancy is just about 47.6 years, uh, which is far less than the uh, global average of 70. And then the literacy is 59.6%. In fact, uh, when you look at other countries in Africa, Nigeria has the highest literacy level. And in fact, in America, the, the foreigners who have the highest number of graduates in America are Nigerians. Again, uh, looking at, let's now look at the status of agriculture. Because we are talking, we're, I'm going to talk about agriculture and how it's going to be sustainable. So what was it uh, in the early 60s and what is today? and what is likely going to happen. That's the whole focus of this paper. Now, uh, in the 60s, Nigerian agriculture was booming and was contributing about 65% of the GDP. Uh, there were a lot of agricultural commodities being uh, uh, exported from the country. But at uh, the same period, the Nigerian oil, of course, was discovered in the, early, in the late 50s so by the scarcity, it was fully developed. And the economy was more or less dependent on oil. And that actually made the country to not to pay much attention on, on agriculture. So uh, the contribution of the GDP, of the GDP by agriculture uh, was dived to only about 2% by the year 2000. And again, uh, the contribution of agriculture generally, as of today, it employs over 70% of the active population and sustains about 86% of the rural household. But most of this are more or less what we call peasantry farming, whereby people farm just to produce food for home and perhaps very little for sale. But still, the ag agriculture is the largest supplier of food to, to the country. Even though you know, the population, there are a lot of importation of uh, agricultural commodities into the country. Now, 
uh, looking at the potential, uh, Nigeria has a lot of potential. In fact, when you compare to several other countries, Nigeria is on the top. One, like I mentioned, it has 91 million hectares of land that are arable. And it has more than 171 dams owned by the federal government, and there are several other small dams that are scattered all over the, all over the country. And then it has extensive river system that cut across all the uh, you know, nook and crannies of the country. And it has seven different distinct climates. And this river, especially River Niger, which is the third biggest river in Africa, uh, is contributing or discharging about 5,589 million cubic of water per second into Atlantic Ocean. And this water is cutting across. River Niger cut across over seven countries and discharged into Atlantic Ocean through the country. And you know, with the River Niger also, there are several other uh, tributaries uh, that cut across the town, I mean the country. Some of them starting within the country, some of them outside the country. And all these you know, contribute into the Atlantic, and they are also making available water to the country. In fact, this is the uh, agroecological zones. The country is divided into uh, uh, agroecological zones, and uh, this is the map of the, of the zone. And in Nigeria, in terms of water, uh, the minimum amount of water that is being received in a given area is about 700 millimeters, while you can also receive as much as 4,000 millimeters of rainfall in a year. What it means is that you have a range of amount of water between 700 millimeters to 4,000 millimeters of rainfall that allows the production of several over hundreds of agricultural commodities. This is a very big potential that in Africa, not only in Africa, all over the world, very few countries that have this. Then, uh, similarly, another strain when it comes to the issue of agriculture in Nigeria. Under the federal government, we have what is called Agriculture Research Institute. And this Agriculture Research Institute, they were given different commodities to, to, to mandate commodities uh, to develop genetically and improve such genetic, genetic of such commodities. And then, so these are the mandates, genetic improvement of mandate crop, as well as the bluff uh, of improved production, processing, and utilization of technology for the mandate crop. So this uh, 18 research institutes, they have more than 5,000 scientists that are working on different agricultural commodities across the nation, and they are scattered all over the country. So these are a uh, 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 very big strain, and, uh, can actually, you know, if it's fully harnessed, can really, you know, uh, uh, create a sustainable agriculture in the country. This is the same uh, that I'm talking about. And in addition to the uh, community-based research institute, we also have what you call service research institute. Service like NLS National Agriculture Extension Research Lazar Service, where I'm heading, uh, it actually mandated to advance the frontiers of agricultural extension in the country. Extension, of course, means that, uh, taking the technology from where it has been developed, packaging the technology, and disseminate to the people who are going to use the technology, and then take the feedback of this technology to, uh, uh, to, 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 to the research centers. So we also have other, like, academic mechanization, National Center for Academic mechanization that have mandate for, you know, developing uh, appropriate technology and machinery uh, for, for agriculture in the country. And then there's also others that, another one that is uh, a National Veterinary uh, Research Institute uh, that has been given the mandate to identify animal diseases, develop their treatment and control, and then production of animal vaccine against uh, disease. Now, uh, with all this, we have a lot of challenges. One of the, one of the major challenge to agriculture in Nigeria is 
the issue of investment. The share of agriculture in, in federal government's annual budget, because the investment by federal government or by government, it comes through the annual budget that is actually being allocated to, to agriculture. So in the past, from 2000 to 2007, uh, the shares range between 1.3 to 7.4. And in 2017, the percentage of budget to agriculture was just about 1.8% total. So uh, that means there's lack of, of course, uh, there's lack of reliable data of some other investment, especially from the private sector. So, the second other challenge is the issue of mechanization. I would like to quote uh, Ikeun Wimi Adishina, the, the president of African Development Bank, who is also a Nigerian, a laureate of 2017 World, uh, World Food Prize, who said, an American farmer plays golf after I had this job using mechanized farming equipment to achieve great success and prosperity. While our Nigerian farmers retire to their poor homes with little or nothing to show for a hard day's job, given their hoe and cutlasses. Some of the farmers in Nigeria leave their houses as early as 5 a.m. and they may come back around 7 p.m. But they hardly produce enough to feed their family. And hardly they can also use what they are producing to send their children to a good school. So that is what it is today because of the low mechanization. And to portray this, the mechanization level in Nigeria, when you look at one of the indicators using the horsepower per hectare, is just about 0 0.3, 0, uh, 0, 0 0.03 horsepower per hectare against the recommended 1.5 horsepower per hectare for Africa because of the nature of you know, agriculture production in Africa. Uh, my institute that has a mandate for you know, uh, conducting survey, uh, in uh, 2013 we conducted a survey and found out that the amount, the number of tractors in the country, at that time, of course, the population was about 180 million, and we just got about, just barely about 30,000 tractors which when you look at it, 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 it tractors is very small compared to the land that we're talking about all, uh, uh, 91 million hectares and you have 30,000. And then in addition to that, most of these tractors were found to be broken. So in short, you find that the tractors for a hectare, you count about 10 tractors compared to even an uh, uh, African average, which is 22 per hectare, as recommended. And in fact, to cap it off, only about 5% of the farmers in Nigeria are accessible to, are accessible to good, good seeds and be able to also utilize the seeds in terms of using them, in terms of planting space, in terms of type of uh, seed to, to use. So another thing, again, another challenge is the poor, poor infrastructure. Our transportation system is very poor. The inadequate public institutions are there. Uh, under the bluff financial system, very high interest rate, uh, people accessing loan, especially farmers, is still over 20 percent, 20 percent interest. So when uh, farmers are hardly making enough profit from their production, and they are now asking them to be about 22 percent interest, you know, on the loan, it's quite uh, very difficult for many of them to even uh, think about loan. Then the issue of uh, for marketing information uh, in the effective extension system. The, when it also, when you look at the issue of livestock, you find that I will quickly give you some graph. You can see, uh, if you look at beef, this is the demand, and, and uh, the, the demand, and this is uh, what is available. So you find that apart from X, almost all you know, uh, <coughs> commodities they are actually in short supply, that they cannot meet the demands. And like I mentioned, this demand is increasing on daily basis. Similarly, when you look at the fishery, uh, this is the, the, the production in metricon, and the needs is far, 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 almost twice what is available. Now, another issue of extension, that is the, you know, a big challenge is 
packaging this information and disseminating to poor farmers as a result of decreasing fund, uh, limited capacity of the extension staff, high extension agent farmer ratio. Uh, what we used to do, or what was introduced in the country in the 70s, was what we call uh, T and V, training and visit extension system, whereby every extension staff will actually service number of farmers. The recommended is one extension staff to about 800 farmers. But today, one extension staff has more than 17,000 farmers, which is quite very uh, impracticable uh, uh, for, for such extension agents to service them. Again, uh, when we look at also, just to summarize all these challenges, is when one look at the 2018 uh, goalkeepers report, which was actually done by Bill uh, Gates and Bill and Melinda Gates. In that report, I am quoting: Nigeria will have about 150 million people in extreme poverty, out of projected population of over 400 million by the year 2050. Going by this figure, it means that Nigeria will represent about 36 percent of the total number of people in extreme poverty worldwide. And of course, extreme poverty here is referring to people living below line of $1.9 per day. So uh, those challenges and the low productivity all actually resulted into this report, because this is a report of 2018 that is really not much different from what is today. Now, what are, what's the way forward? Having now given you the potential uh, the challenges analysis. The second thing is, what is the way forward? And in the way forward, we have to ask some questions. What should be done to change the current trend? What do we do to change it? And uh, what do we do to change it? What should be done to increase agricultural productivity? What should be done to attain the potential productivity? And what should be done to build sustainable agriculture? That is the focus. That is exactly what I'm trying to focus on told you what, uh, where Nigeria is located, the number of people, the challenges, and the potential. Now, going by this, uh, we need collective efforts targeting well-designed policy to address identify problems or issues. The first thing is what, who are the stakeholders that we need to work, that need to work and make collective efforts. One, uh, on one part, the first part is government. We have three Tiers of government, three, three different governments. We have the federal government, we have state, we have local government. So these three levels of government, and each of these levels, ha they have their own legislature. So there has to be, you know, a concerted effort to actually address the issue of agriculture. Then the second very important stakeholder, stake, say group of stakeholders are researchers and extension partners. And then the other third, the third which is also very important, is the uh, educational institution. Uh, at the, in the educational institution, we have the primary, secondary, and tertiary level. And then the fourth, and all of them also very important, is the private sector. And that you have the farmers, you have the professors, you have the marketers, you have the investors, you have the internalists and exporters. So let's quickly see what each of this category of group is expected to do, so that at the end of the day, we can have a system like China in Nigeria. Uh, one, issue of government. We talk about policy formulation. Government must form, you know, formulate policy, very clear policy based on research. That research must be conducted, okay, what do you want? Increase production of this food. In, uh, attain food security by a given period of time. What are the strategies to attain food security by this time? Okay? Then, second, very important is government must in, increase investments. Uh, we have the Moputo Declaration that was done by the uh, African Union in 2003. And in that, they all signed that they will be increasing their annual budget from whatever it was at that level to reach 10%. And in fact, in Africa, it's only one country that has reached up to 7 or 8%, you know, uh, and that is Rwanda. All other countries have not actually been invested as much as that, perhaps maybe South Africa. So uh, therefore, the government has to actually, okay, increase this budget. 
in uh, not only increase the budget that also has to be timely release some of the issues that are also very challenging especially in nigeria is that it's not only the budget budgetary allocation but when is the money being released as you all know that agriculture is time bound and that if money is not released as a twin due then definitely there will be problem then there also has to be issue of regulations then the issue of protection and security you have to protect investors you have to protect the researchers. You have to protect everybody so that the atmosphere and the environment can be conducive for all the stakeholders to work uh, for targeted purposes. And then there also has to be incentives and participation of local and foreign investment. Yes, the, the local investment has to actually be given some incentives. Similarly, the foreign investment in agriculture because there is a huge amount of market has a good amount of resources and we need this investment and for the investors to come there has to be a kind of incentives and there has to be a kind of protection to be sure that yes whatever they're investing is going to be protected over a period of time and then you also need partnership and synergy among all the tiers uh, of, of, uh, of government the government um, we're talking about we have the initiative we have the uh, the, the the executive and we have the judiciary, and as well as time, we have also three levels. We have the local, we have the state. So there has to be a kind of synergy, you know, and a concerted effort towards a purpose. Now, when it comes to the researchers, there are a lot of research works that have been on shelf in Nigeria today. Like I mentioned, we have more than 70 faculties of agriculture, and in each of these faculties of agriculture, there are several PhD and master students that are actually currently undertaking research, all addressing one problem or the other. And they are, in addition, this is in addition to the research issues that are in existence that are being funded by government. And most of this, there have been a lot of research results, but these research results are on shelf. They are not actually, many people are not aware of them. So, one, we have to catalog such researches and package them and disseminate them for utilization. Then there also has to be research coordination to address and identify food problems. The research should be tailored such that it will address problems that have been identified from the field. And then there has to also has to be, you know, initiate and conduct problem solving research and in a participatory manner. And the issue of synergy is also very important. Still, we also need to go into, yeah, okay. So, still, we need to go into new technology, that, uh, like biotech, nanotech, and so on. We need to go into that both for crop, livestock, you know. And similarly, when it comes to the other parts, the extension personnel, there has to be a kind of active support to extension services. Because whatever result that has been obtained by any research, if it cannot be disseminated to people who are going to use it, that research is useless. So, there has to be that. Similarly, the use of ICT is very important now that uh, we can leverage on the use of uh, ICT to deliver extension services. In the past, the extension personnel need to be physically present in different places, but today, because of the issue of ICT, telephone bills and internet bills, you can reach out and pass the information and get feedback without physically being there. This is one of the uh, ICT that we have where uh, in NLS we are deploying. This is what you call a call center model, which is uh, actually being utilized to, to receive uh, uh, calls from, from farmers, and this is the building. Now, coming back to the educational institutions, which is another very important stakeholder in this, we need to review agricultural curriculum in the country. We need to make sure that the practical is about 70%. Most of our curriculum, uh, these are curriculums we inherited more than 50 years ago from, from our colonial masters. And they themselves have changed them. So we need to change them so that they can be practically oriented for agriculture. Then we also need to challenge some of the faculties to develop, I mean, to produce for themselves and produce for sale. And then we also have to make it compulsory for every agriculture student to have a successful demonstration floor before he graduates. And then there has to be compulsory establishment of graduate school in all public schools so that agriculture can be initiated right from primary school and secondary school, that people can at least be aware of agriculture and its passion. 
not to be looking at agriculture as a partnership. Similarly, there has to be, you know, a concerted effort for funding of this by the three tiers of government, federal and state government, and uh, there has to also be, you know, facilitate, uh, encourage and support staff exchange between within and outside the country. And then coming back to another very important uh, sector, which is the private sector, there has to be a lot of incentives for the private investment in agriculture, and there has to be deliberate encouragement and support of uh, agripreneurship and capacity building for potential uh, agripreneurs, uh, agripreneurs, especially among the youth and the women. You see, uh, the, uh, the average age of a farmer in Nigeria is about 47 years. And the, 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 the percentage of the population, 70% of the population have age between, you know, 1 to 25 years. That means that there's a lot of problems. It means that youth are not being attracted into agriculture because of lack of, because of low marketization, low agricultural marketization. Many people don't want to go and bend down and use catalysts to do farming. And at the end of the day, you produce very little. So there has to be a concerted effort to build the capacity of the farmers, especially the youth, and then make uh, agriculture to be very attractive and be very, very profitable. Then we also have to provide single digit interest uh, loan for agriculture. Uh, well, yes, okay, I will soon go. <laughs> so we, we need to support the development of agricultural machineries, uh, both uh, locally made as well as those that have to be imported, have to be imported. Uh, now that uh, the, 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 the whole world is a global village, so whatever technology that is imported, we can also use it and then encourage others to come and invest to produce some of the technology that will, you know, uh, address our problems. In conclusion, the need to make agriculture sustainable in, in the face of population explosion and the climate change cannot be overemphasized. This is very important uh, if we are going to be, uh, I mean, to prevent Nigeria being the headquarters of, you know, extreme poverty by the 2030 as, you know, for precise by, 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 by goalkeepers then we need to work hard. We need to see how we can actually prevent that to happen. And making agriculture to be sustainable in Nigeria is a equivalent tax that requires the effort of both government and private sectors. Uh, luckily, the technology being developed within Nigeria and in foreign countries will be handy to achieve this objective. Thank you very much. Galassia.